Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So we have a really big update on the SJM case. Number one, SJM's father says now there is conclusive, obvious evidence that his son's disappearance was not an accident and that there is definitely somebody else responsible. And we have the final results of the police's sham second investigation like as we've probably come to expect they made another announcement about the ending of the investigation that they said was already ended so in his most recent blog post called chungmin's return sjm's father says that Last week on Friday, he went back to the Central Police Station to retrieve some items of his sons that were directly related to the investigation that continued on his criminal charges that he filed against Mr. A. So remember back in June when he filed these charges, I believe it was June 24th, he said, mm -mm, Mr. A, I'm filing these criminal charges against you. I'm accusing you of violence. So some kind of violence, physical harm against my son because there were cuts, deep cuts, that were basically contusions and concussions on his head and on his cheek. And then also for abandonment. For in any case, whatever situation it was, you abandoned him. So those were the two charges that Mr. Son had levied against Mr. A. But about five days later, the police, after they said that, oh, well, we're going to make a special committee. They opened it, like, I think on the 28th. And then they said that, like, oh, it's going to be a special committee. We don't even know who's going to be on this committee. And then they had the media running crazy in circles, like trying to figure out who's going to be on this committee. And then they announced that they're going to do the committee. They're going to do the investigation. And then, like, on the day or, like, the night after they announced the investigative committee they said oh we're all done we're done already even though there were indications that they were going to be meeting for about two weeks they said oh we're done already saying like mm -mm, there's nothing to see here folks there is absolutely no criminal indication and we're done with the investigation mind you they never even explained how sjm went missing and why they were only focused on whether the main suspect had any sort of evidence against him. So obviously, that was the focus, even though they kept saying throughout that he was never a suspect. So, hello, doublespeak. So anyhow, so they said after that, okay, well, because we have to follow the procedures, SJM's father had filed these criminal charges, we'll keep one really great investigative team on SJM's father's case, we'll give you great service, and just sit tight, sir, we'll figure it all out. Well, four months passed, SJM's father said they never contacted him once, never gave him an update, he never knew what was going on. But apparently, what they did collect from his son to do some more investigation were some of his clothes. And they sent only the shirt that he was wearing, the t-shirt, to the National Forensic Service. It came back, they said, oh, there was nothing there. And then they said that they looked at the injuries on his head again, and they said, mm, can't link it to the direct cause of his passing. Of course not, because they said that it was, you know, due to basically not being able to breathe in the water. But the most interesting thing was that he said that he got the pants back from his son and he had found, you know, the mask. You know, we're all wearing masks because of, you know, Cerveza. And so he said that it was just stuffed in his pocket and he had thought nothing of it because, you know, of course, 
it would be in there logically, he thought. But then he said he gave it a real hard thought and he said, oh, that is for him essentially the most obvious piece of evidence that it all crystallizes that there is obviously somebody else at play here who was involved because we'll go through this he says that first of all that mask was always on his son from the CCTV footage that we saw whenever he was in public, whenever he was going through the bunny tunnel, whenever he was in the convenience store, whenever he was even trying to go pick up the food from the Coupon Eats delivery guy, he always had his mask on. So he's saying, look, whenever he was out and about, he was wearing that mask. So this guy was very responsible. So when he was drinking on the picnic mat, of course he would have put it in his pocket because he would need it to go home on the way back. So he would make sure that it would be in a safe space while he was drinking. Now, at first I thought like, well, yeah, of course. Well, like it could be in his pocket still. But he said, look, if he had, first of all, voluntarily gone into the water, he would have left his wallet, mask, and shoes on the riverbank or on the picnic mat. You don't just go into the water like that for a nice little swim with your wallet and your mask that's going to get wet and your shoes. They found his wallet and his mask in his pants. The shoes were missing. And of course he said, we all know who had his phone and Mr. A had SJM's phone until the next morning when randomly he ran into SJM's parents and SJM's parents were like, well, dude, that's like, I think that's my son's phone. Like, is that my son's phone? Oh yeah. They were probably calling it and he probably rang and then he was just like, oh, I think that's my son's phone. Give me, oh yeah, give me the phone. And now he's just like, that is just so suspicious. Because he says, like, that proves that most likely that when he had passed out, when we saw the picture of him passed out at 2.18 a.m., that he had just been passed out. And then at the 3.31 a.m. video where they went over the riverbank, that he had probably involuntarily gone over the riverbank in the same condition. So now what he's implying is actually that he probably was not awake. Because remember, there was some speculation that perhaps he had woken up and then maybe they had gotten into scuffle and then one ran first and then one ran afterwards. Or it was like they had fought and then one person had fallen. But the way it sounds like now is that probably he may not have ever, ever woken up and he had been just thrown over. You know what I mean? Kind of like thrown over, dragged and thrown over like a sack of potatoes and then followed down there to see what he could do about it. Because when they did the test, remember the conservative YouTube channel uh, who did the extensive on-site tests, they did simulations where they tried to do the heights and recreate the images from afar. And it didn't match up when guys were standing up. They were crouched. That's when the images matched. And so that makes much more sense to me is that how else do you really, in what position do you sort of heave somebody over when they're like standing up? No, like basically in almost a crouched position, like when they're half up and then boom over like a real big push that's why i think it looks like a push as in like they fought and pushed but he may have just been pushed 
because he needed the force to just try to drag something. Because remember, Mr. A had already admitted that he had dragged that thing up the embankment, except he may have gotten his facts mixed up because he claims he was blacked out from 11 a.m. 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. He may have gotten that mixed up. Instead of dragging him up, he probably meant he dragged him down. And so because of that scenario, SJM's father says that it is abundantly clear that there has been a grave injustice done here. But that is only part one. Let's go over part two. And yes, we're going to take it back to those super suspicious fishermen. He says now it's absolutely confirmed that in the testimony of the fishermen, they had said they saw, the fishermen said they had seen, a middle aged male go into the water you know at 4 40 a.m when he said oh how refreshing it is and splashed around and everybody was just like oh uh -huh, yeah who does that who does that well if they had seen a middle-aged man that completely rules out Chungmin, who totally is not a middle-aged man what then SJM's father then also says and implies is that he's saying like it looks like there were a lot of people there loitering around to make sure that SJM's body which was involuntarily placed into the water would not surface up again. So remember if there was a cleanup crew then Maybe those suspicious fishermen were not so suspicious in their observation after all of seeing a middle-aged cleanup crew man enter the water. Because remember, these suspicious, suspicious fishermen were actually not one entire group, even though they tried to make it look like the entire group. There was that young group that went into the TV interview and there was an older group of men. And what really had happened was they pro the younger group was the one with the talking piece. That m Those were the, s the most suspicious ones. It looked like they had just kind of clung on to those guys. Like, remember the younger guys who supposedly had never fished before? And they were like, I don't know, what was this eel here? Like, what were we supposed to do? They had never gone fishing there before. They had no idea what to do. They said that they had met up with some other friends. These old men weren't their friends. It's basically kind of like, oh, hey, who are you? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, we're like instant friends. Like, they just probably met them right then and there. You know how, like, when you just go someplace and then if you're going to be sitting there forever together, it's like, I guess you just become friends. And so the other I believe it was the other men who had s said that at least the old one. And then they started like, remember there was like conflicting information early on. First they said it was a guy. Then they said, oh, maybe it wasn't clear whether it was a guy or a girl. So they, and they is the important part. Who is they? The police. The police themselves had known the testimony from the fishermen said, middle-aged man enters the water. What ended up in the mid-investigation police report? None of that. What ended up in the announcement to the media and to the public? None of that. What ended up in the information portrayed or handed over to Hot Daddy's show unanswered questions? None of that. The police themselves manipulated the testimony and the information that went out to the public and never mentioned that it was a middle-aged man seen going into the water. They kept positioning this possibility that there were 
a whole team of like seven or more eyewitnesses who were fishing that night that had probably seen a young man who was drunk going into the water when that was absolutely not what even the testimony had said. So how shady is that? There are major oversights of this investigation still. The 3.31 a.m. fall over the riverbank, we have so much CCTV footage and analysis over that that was not investigated by the police and it was overlooked by the police, not put into the report or the announcements. The 3.37 a.m. suspicious actions inconsistent with the evidence and eyewitness testimony by Mr. A. You know how he was like on the phone with his parents but said he was just kind of chilling with SJM, never reported the phone call until he was pressed, never investigated, never mentioned. Mr. A's own admission that he dragged SJM up from the river embankment, never investigated, completely overlooked by the police. The 5.14 a.m., incident where Mr. A's father miss, meets with the suspicious kabang man, which they're calling the man with the bag, to do a, a parent transaction. That was not investigated and that was also overlooked. And remember, the police have even said when SJM's father went back to ask for CCTV footage after 5 a.m., they said, after 5 a.m. has nothing to do with your case. Which makes no sense. That's when the parents arrived. That's when the parents were all over the scene. And they said that that had nothing to do with his case. So SJM's father says he thanks all of the supporters who have given him the strength to carry on because without them, he probably wouldn't have had the mental capability to even go to the police station to collect the belongings of his son and then probably have come to this conclusion and this analysis that really makes a lot of sense. And he posted a link to another Blue House petition petition that goes to the president of South Korea that one of his supporters had made. And this is a petition that I believe anybody with a social media account, there are many different login links that you can choose. So if you're overseas, you can also sign it. However, of course, you know, there are questions of whether this would also make a difference because the last one with over 500,000 signatures just got a very tepid, pallid response. However, it is a good platform to launch a different conversation. So I'd encourage all of you to sign it. I'll put a link below. So the police gave the materials back on Friday. Then on Sunday, they announced, which basically means that they had also on Friday probably told SJM's father because he did not show up to the candlelight vigil, I believe, for his son at the park on the following, on the Saturday, the day after, probably because he was like processing all of this. They're saying that, oh, we now have concluded the investigation. Now see how this makes no sense because they already said they concluded the investigation so now they have to say again that they concluded the investigation so obviously it looks like they prematurely concluded the investigation the first time why are they so desperate and are so impatient are in such a hurry to close this investigation and do such a shoddy job and leave all of these 
unanswered questions for the rest of the public to contend with and now have completely destroyed the credibility of the police department and especially the division down in Socho. And so on Sunday, the police department of Socho said that, well, there's no evidence sufficient enough to link any kind of criminal negligence to Mr. A and this incident. So before, there was that position of absolutely no, nothing, no evidence, no evidence, no evidence. So now critics are saying like, well, now you change your tune a little bit. You're saying like insufficient evidence. Because remember, we have seen from unanswered questions when they prematurely just rushed out that documentary on this case all of those like famous criminal profilers say like there's no evidence no evidence no evidence and so now the police are saying insufficient evidence so all they did was check the shirt so that's pretty convenient huh you just check one little thing that probably like would have nothing of value and then say like, oh, well, that's nothing to see there. So the police said that they're not going to refer this investigation to the prosecution. So of course that pissed off SJM's family. They said that they are going to protest that. In this situation now, SJM's family can request that this case go to the prosecution and then the prosecutors can ask the police to investigate it again but i mean how are you going to ask the police to investigate it again when you don't trust their investigation in the first place so what are we doing here we are in crazy town so you know they're Recently, in another situation around the world, I don't remember where I read this on Twitter, but they said, like, when things don't add up, it's because the truth was never in the equation in the first place. And I think that is the situation that we have here, of course, from the beginning. Now, I just wanted to clear up a couple of concepts that I have seen on the message board in terms of questions because I think clearing that up will help all of us move together as one team to eventually maybe put our brains together to perhaps help SJM's family. There's one question of like, well, why can't they get the CCTVs released in the name of protecting people's privacy? Because when you go into a public space, don't you forego your privacy rights? Well, that is one of the biggest, biggest differences uh, between Korea and I would say the United States. This question came from the United States. This law might be different, of course, in other parts of the world. But this type of law you think is probably standard everywhere around the world, but it alters like literally like you probably think you would live in a different universe so americans think like once you go into a public space you forego all rights to kind of privacy so if somebody's like filming or like taking pictures like hey that's all that's all on you like you do something crazy or stupid and it gets on film then too bad for you you're in a public space in korea though you are protected even if you're doing the craziest kind of weirdest thing you're not supposed to have your image taken you can protest that i mean if you find if you can find them if you can sue them like you you would have to go through the whole process but you would be in your rights to do so and you would be able to protect your image even if you were in a public space. That's why you see a lot more mosaics in Korean entertainment shows, like especially when they go out onto the street and you know they're doing all the variety shows, you'll see a lot more faces blurred out. And that is because in Korea, those are more of the privacy laws. And I would say, yes, like there is a tradition of people here, like not wanting to expose their identity because there has been a long history of being able to weaponize your private life 
against you and you not having any recourse. So let's say you were seen in a compromising position, but you weren't doing anything wrong, but somebody accused you of it, but they had the ins with the police or they had the ins with the people in power and they can totally get you in trouble get you in trouble depending on like what time or what era it could have been could have locked you up taken your house anything you know it could have been catastrophic taken your family taken your wife taken your horse you never know and so in a very unequal society where you can corrupt levers of power these types of personal details that can be weaponized against you are very dangerous and so in one way this was kind of a collective response to protect everybody against that but i would say in more of the modern context why people are a little bit more accepting of leaning towards like protecting everybody's privacy to this extreme is that because we live in such a repressive hierarchical society where your public life and image has to be so like on point and you have to endure so much kind of oppression like you always have to be the yes man that everybody expects pretty much everybody expects that whoever they interact with has like the other freaky deaky side that goes wild to let out some steam and nobody wants to see it and i don't want to see yours you don't want to see mine we definitely don't want to have it like recorded in pos for posterity and so i think because that happens so often and again when we say that there is a lot more leeway for public drunkenness and then people just having a lot more latitude for people acting out as long as they do it i guess in private i mean if you count the number of motels in this country seriously people are very forgiving in practicality or when it comes down to actual reality of people doing sinful things and so i think people are generally a little bit paranoid of privacy in that sense but that does not a hundred percent excuse what is going on in this situation and nor should that actually be a justification moving forward i think we should probably move more towards the model of if you're in a public space then you are being in public why should we have such leeway for your freaky deakiness? Because you're not even, I mean, who does real freaky deaky stuff anyway in public? But even just like walking maybe with the person you're about to do some freaky deaky stuff with is enough to make people go, you know, like, oh gosh, this is a little bit crazy. But again, that should not be held on a higher plateau i believe than public safety do you want your public safety to be sacrificed because somebody wants to go some to some you know freaky deaky motel with some other person and they're like scared of that being kind of like whatever or like in this case like if you know like Maybe a middle-aged man and a middle-aged woman are taking a walk in the park together and they're not husband and wife. And I think that is a little bit some of, you know, bit of the concern with like the CCTV cameras. They don't, you know, and it's kind of like they probably all know that their friends, wives and husbands are doing stuff like that. And so that though should not be held at a higher standard than public safety and so i believe definitely we need to release these cctv images to get to the truth 
The second concept I wanted to go over is moral relativity, especially when it comes to the police and the ability for Korean people to just take one little whiff of something and know that it's corrupt. I'll take an example right now. There is a documentary three episode series on Korea's first serial killer that really instituted reforms in Korea's police department, specifically Gangnam Police Department, Seoul Police Department, and the star criminal profiler that shows up in that documentary also was pivotal in the SJM case and showed up in unanswered questions. And one of the whistleblowers that was pivotal to that case was a former cop. Ring any bells? But he became a business owner of, let's say, ladies of the night. And in that era especially, of course it happens still now, but especially then, there was a lot of continued relations with the police because you needed to have a bribery system of basically like monthly payouts to the police in order to operate your business. So of course it would be better if you actually were a former police officer because you have all of the contacts. Well, this owner was noticing that many of his employees were going missing and he thought like, oh gosh, like, I guess we can't rely on these girls. They're just like, you know, going AWOL. But then he was just like, there is something a little bit odd about this. I don't think that this is what it's, what's going on. Then the serial killer calls from the phone number of one of his employees that had gone missing and he knew exactly, uh-uh, something's going up. And so he wanted to create a sting operation. And so he calls up his old buddies in the police force. So you know what I mean? So like, this is total moral relativity. So this guy who's running this officially, it is officially illegal business that is human trafficking is like now kind of going to be the hero that saves, helps save society from a serial killer. So... <laughs> You see how like people just kind of like jump over like, yep, like his business, like what he does to a community of women. Uh, and they're just like focused on, okay, he's the whistleblower and he has previous contacts with the police force. So now imagine, remember we were going back to the whole Burning Sun nightclub world in Gangnam where the police and the nightclubs have a very close relationship where they are also essentially on the side of the nightclubs. The people in the nightclubs don't act so honorably. And a lot of the times they need doctors to help clean up and treat women and probably guys that are probably injured in the process of being ladies and men of the night. So, a doctor that perhaps specializes in those areas of medicine for over decades who have specialized in that and could keep a very quiet, low profile, do a great job, is essentially what? A hero. So if his son gets in trouble, what do you do for your friend, especially if your friend has been a hero and has always been loyal and good to you? Especially when it seems like it's an accident that happened to their son. Especially when that same person who's been working on cases has seen like crazy like criminals and looks at this medical student and is like no he's totally not on the same category as like you know the people that we put into prison 
you see like how this moral relativity could start to then skew like people's like justifications for perhaps what they're doing. So I just wanted to get that concept out there because the tightness, the coordination seems like it's coming from a place where people are feeling extremely justified in their actions. And that has been my theory on why they're doing a favor to somebody who has been there for them and they see themselves as being good and that this has just been an unlucky situation and they're used to just sacrificing other people even though it may be unfortunate for them and they're innocent because there are worse things that could happen to people in the world i'm not saying that that is correct or good to do but i'm trying to understand it from their perspective because that is then how you create a different strategy that starts to work because obviously we can keep going around and try to get what if we win in this strategy get the police to reinvestigate and do their job again that makes no sense we need a new strategy although we do need to continue down this road to put pressure on this area to definitely go by the book there but on the other hand i think we need to help with alternate strategies that win <laughs> all right guys well let me know what you think this has been a shocker it's been a real hot monday all right, guys, we'll talk to you later. Take care. Tune in next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Love you.